Hello, this is Nicole, and in this week's episode, we've got a really interesting story for you. What you're going to hear is a story from a lady called Rachel Collins. Uh, she works for an institution called GBR, Gilbarco Vida Root, which you may not have heard of, but you would have seen uh, because they have, in the US at least, um, over 65% market share of the dispensers on uh, garage forecourts, fuel dispensers, tank management, et cetera, et cetera. They're also over in, in Europe and around the world. And it's a story of change management. It's a story of taking a 152-year-old company and accelerating its transformation to become a company offering business services to petrol station, gas station, forecourt owners, which are now becoming convenience stores with fuel. And it's how IoT can enable that transformation of the journey for the convenience store owner, but also for GVR, again, as this, you know, large company with bulletproof market share, but in a world that's changing very, very dramatically. And, and, and Rachel tells the story really well. And uh, as someone who came in from the outside to turn a business around, and then has uh, been uh, one of the leaders at GBR that has driven uh, this strategy. So it really is a nice story of business transformation and IoT uh, making a difference uh, in a rapidly changing world around um, uh, a, a very established US uh, hardware focused company. I think you're really going to enjoy this. And so uh, with no further ado, uh, please enjoy the uh, IoT Leaders podcast episode with Rachel Collins of GVR. Here we go. Okay, Rachel, welcome to the IoT Leaders podcast. Thank you so much, Nick. Nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Great to have you here. We've got a really interesting story with multiple facets um, uh, today. But before we get into that, I, I just sort of wanted to explore a little bit about, about Rachel, yourself and your background. Um, maybe we can just start off with where you're based, what you've done, potted history of what, what you've done, and then uh, how did you end up in, um, in GVR? Uh, because I think that's a really interesting story to start off with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm based in Houston, Texas. I've actually lived in Houston for the past 26 years, uh, came here right out of college, but I've actually been professionally based out of a lot of different uh, places, including Austin, Texas, New York, um, traveled a lot. Um, I've been in enterprise software for over 25 years. So started my career here, uh, love deep vertical market software, spent a lot of time in energy just by way of being here in Houston. Uh, I've worked on a lot of high volume transactional systems. So that's really more of my expertise. Back in my 20s, I started my own company when I was fearless uh, and oh, had nothing to lose. And really, yeah, created a, a business around um, financial systems, trading systems, developing in Java, I using middleware. That. So, so you, that's you more became my an entrepreneur uh, yeah, not long yeah. after college. How about that? Hands on developer. I mean, really uh, have a very technical background. Right. And, um, and then leading up to how did I get here to GVR, um, about a decade ago, 10 to 15 years ago, I was running a company uh, that was acquired by private equity. So um, unbeknownst to us, we were owned by a German uh, based parent company that was divesting of their North American assets. And so we were uh, acquired by private equity, an Austin based company. And I proceeded to learn the private equity models, um, the different operating models, financial models, and uh, stuck within private equity, one particular company for about six years and ran about six different uh, acquisitions. And the reason that I loved it is just learning different business models, different delivery models. And so I was really focused on building out the operating playbooks for managed services, full-blown SaaS, because this particular private equity company uh, had more experience in the licensed on-prem software and less about cloud-based software. So spent time there, you know, building out these uh, playbooks. And back in, I guess, 2019, I was approached um, about a company here in Houston. So uh, the opportunity to get off the road a little bit and run a software company locally. And it happened to roll into a company called GBR or Gilbarco Vita Root. And it was the first software acquisition by the company. It was acquired in 2014. 
uh, and I entered the business in 2019, it was uh, not performing as expected. I think it was just a very, very different business model. And so they were looking for someone from you know, software to come in and make some changes to the financial model and the operating model and, and you know, take this underperforming asset to a point that it was you know, growing recurring revenue. And to understand um, that um, the magnitude of, of sort of that change, um, it's worth uh, giving a little bit of context on um, GBR. Uh, and I was just looking at uh, Wikipedia before we uh, hit the record button here. And um, I think you hold a record of, of, of the person who works for the company that's been in the business the longest of, of anyone who's appeared on the IoT Leaders uh, podcast, because what I, what I found was GBR was formed in, in 1870, so 152 years, right. not that many companies uh, kind of, although it wasn't called GBR, and I think it became, it, it wasn't long before it was called Gilbarco after, after it was formed, but part of Exxon for 100 years. So there's a lot of history and culture in, in this company, and you joined it to turn around, a, 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 and it's, it's not a software company, I mean, it's a automatic uh, tank gauge management for for um, petrol or as you call it in the US gas station um, uh, four courts uh, the fuel management systems we're going to get into all of that but this is not a cutting edge software Silicon Valley or even Austin Texas software company you found it's yourself not. in that's so that's that's quite a that's quite a leap uh, into the into the into this company that's right. Big change, big challenge. I mean, you know, I never like mapped out my career. I always looked for the, the you know, spicy meatball kind of challenges. And I thought this one had it written all over, um, you know, because at the time we were spinning off uh, a new holding company. Um, but to your point, you know, GVR is a deep rooted industrial manufacturing company, something right. that I knew nothing about. So not only did I not have any retail petroleum experience, but I didn't have any industrial manufacturing. So to come in and essentially run a turnaround of a software acquisition within this um, deep rooted culture, this heritage and really this pride, right? I mean, a very, very successful industrial manufacturing organization. Uh, I thought it was going to be a big challenge. It has been a big challenge, but it's yeah, been a lot sure. of fun and I've learned so much, um, you know, as a result. So now I feel like I, I know a little bit more about the manufacturing industry and you know, a lot more about just hardware and how to integrate and, you know, use that as a conduit for software and services. So I think it's, um, I've grown as a leader um, and happy to share more about just the experiences I've had with the culture. They're dramatically different. I, I, I would like to go there um, uh, uh, because I just, I, I, again, we don't, we've not had a story like this on, on the uh, podcast and, um, you know, a couple of points up here. I mean, full disclosure for our listeners, no surprise. Uh, uh, GVR and, and SI were partners. We, you know, uh, GVR use SI's uh, offering, so full disclosure there. But secondly, I've talked in, in previous podcasts about my role in, in two companies, actually, Hewlett Packard in the Valley in, in California and, and Cisco uh, based out of Europe, but where I was doing change management, yeah. um, trying to change large organizations, not with anywhere near the type of history that GVR had, but probably the most relevant one mapping onto what your role is, was at Cisco, which was you know, the world's biggest box company, it sold more computers, boxes than anybody else. And then trying to uh, turn it into a software and managed services company and managing software companies within Cisco. The issues were huge. I mean, nothing, everything was orthogonal. I mean, nothing, nothing was designed for software. Nothing was designed for recurring revenue. Um, OPEX, just the way you think about software and the engineering and the way you do your financial systems. And it was a real change management system. And, and uh, you know, we had to do, we had to sort of build another culture within a culture. That's but fine. you, you at least I knew the industry, right? I mean, I, I, I'd been Cisco several years before they asked me to do that gig. And I've been in tech for, for, for many years. But you came in with no knowledge of the oil industry, no, the hard, no knowledge of the hardware side, right and with a mandate to turn around a, 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 a poor performing software business which was their first software acquisition so you you like a challenge right? very high profile i'll tell you or a masochist right i mean one of yes. the other but yeah <laughs> i was kind of um, hinting that <laughs> yeah yeah no but i mean it was it's so interesting and i knew i mean i think what drew me to it as well is this was a strategic acquisition. This isn't something, it wasn't private equity where, you know, you're trying to find a path to exit. This is a critical part 
of the strategy of the overall organization and really the future of the company. There's a, a very, um, there's a distinct awareness that the company needs to transform and start moving away from focusing on hardware sales and having the economic value within the equipment. There's an understanding that now that's shifting and it's more the services and solutions that can be delivered through that equipment. And that's the future of the business. And that's the nub of this story, right? So, so just for those those uh, listeners, uh, and indeed myself, who who are not immersed, pardon the pun, in the in fuel tank uh, management and everything that goes on in the dispensers um, that, that dispense the fuel on the forecourt, and we're going to get into the whole retail side of it soon because the world's changing very rapidly and the EV charges. But before we get into that, um, why? You guys have, uh, I understand, like in North America, like 65 plus percent market share. So someone could look at this and say, OK, so what was the burning platform? Why was it? Why did they take the risk? Why did they why did they see this as, as strategic? What's the problem? You have 65 percent market share. There's millions of cars. At the time you were recruited, EV wasn't as anywhere big as big as it is now. So 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 there was a visionary, clearly, or there was a strategy around reinvention of this 150 year old company. That's right. I think it was a few things. I mean, number one, when you refer to the market share, that's the installed base of equipment. And so, as you know, equipment businesses being non-recurring revenue, you know, you start over every year trying to hit these monthly numbers, these quarterly numbers. And so there was a, a very deliberate focus of our board members and our leadership to say, we want to change the mix of revenue. We have about 80, 20 non recurring to recurring. Let's try to get that recurring revenue, which is a bit more fluid and predictable up to let's say 60, 65%. So that was a part of it. I think the second thing is just from a regulatory standpoint, if you've heard about EMV, which is, uh, what is it, Europay, MasterCard, Visa, but essentially what was happening is from a regulatory standpoint, the liability was shifting from the credit card companies to the network operators, the site owners, when you pay at the pump. And so we saw a big surge in orders of updated dispensers, modern dispensers, but we knew that was going to drop off after that became you know, the law. And so that had happened actually last year. So we knew there was going to be a drop off in um, equipment um, needs and orders. Um, and I think, but the third part was just that naturally the business has seen that there's this divergence from fuel and convenience retail. And so you know, fuel is no longer necessarily the draw. Uh, It's no longer just your local gas station, you go to get gas and then you walk inside and you might buy a Coke. It's actually quite different where people are actually drawn to the experience at the convenience store and less so around fuel. Some people may not fill up their car when they go to a convenience store. And so you're seeing a transformation in that industry. And so I think just all of those macro dynamics are um, some of the reasons that there was this shift in mindset strategically right. to tap into recurring. And, 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 and being such a big player in the industry, you, your board, your senior exec team saw this coming and thought we need to prepare for it That's right. because it's coming and the model is changing. So let's talk through the steps. Actually, you know what, before we do, I'm going to throw a curveball at you. I'm going to apologize for this in advance. So I've lived in the U.S., uh, multiple countries, but the U.S., and uh, of course, living back in the U.K. now. I don't know whether you know the answer to this, so apologies if, if you don't. Um, but I didn't tell you this question in advance. So in, in Europe, in the U.K. in particular, you don't pay at the pump, right. right? So you don't have the, uh, like when I used to fill my car up in, in California, I could put the nozzle in and I could press the click and it would it would stay and I could walk away from the car and then it would click off. Well, we don't have that. You can't, you can't, you have to keep on squeezing the trigger right. in the UK. And although the dispensers have credit card capabilities on them, they're all turned off or pretty much all turned off. Is there a reason that you're aware of as to why the US allows you to pay in the pump and in general, uh, certainly in the UK, but I think in quite a bit of Europe, you, you still have to go inside, pay for fuel. I think it's just some of it's regulatory, uh, but they're just dramatically different markets. I mean, North America, whether you're talking about just compliance, regulatory conditions, or just the footprint of these C-stores, it's so different. And then you go to Europe, for instance, where you have very fragmented market, um, where you have, you know, Europe alone has over 200 countries. And so you're going to have different needs 
Um, I think that's a big part of it. What we have seen outside of North America is in North America, people want to pay at the pump. They're still using their credit card, whether it's frictionless and they tap the credit card. In Europe, we're seeing a lot more demand for mobile payment solutions. Yes. So I, I just think that, um, you know, it's a, it's a great question. I, I think it's a combination, again, of just consumer uh, demand okay. and uh, also just regulatory regional nuances. Okay. We're just, we're just kind of weird over here. Okay. And you're right. I mean, I haven't used a physical credit card for over two years because I paid exactly. my phone. So it wouldn't, even if it was there, I wouldn't use it. So that's a good, that's a good point. So let's go back to the, the stages of the, of the journey. So you, you come in, turn around a software um, unit, uh, which I think is called Onsite 360. If, if Insight, yeah. Insight, Insight excuse me. Insight yes. 360. And just at a very high level, I, I mentioned ATG and um, uh, managing the fuel levels, but it does a little bit more than that, um, doesn't it? So, what, so broadly, what, what does the solution do if I'm a, a forecourt owner, as you call it, a C site, a, a C store, a convenience store owner with fuel on the site? So, what, what does in, Insight um, 360 do for me? So in a nutshell, um, to keep it simple, we are remote operations management. So when you think about, we connect to equipment agnostically, not just what we manufacture, but we connect to an ATG is essentially the device that monitors your inventory level in those large underground storage tanks of petroleum. So right. we connect to the ATG, we can help um, just manage your whole supply chain. We also connect to the the pumps, the dispensers above ground, and we can monitor the health of the equipment. If there's, you know, sometimes you'll go to a gas station and there's a bag over the pump. We yeah. make sure you never have to put a bag over the pump that we can, we can resolve issues remotely. And then inside the store, I mean, many people don't know that GVR has over 30% market share in North America alone, the point of sale. So we also have remote capabilities to connect to the point of sale inside the store and remotely monitor that. What's so powerful is we can do things such as send software for updates. So if you have a network of hundreds of sites, we can do all of that remotely. Um, and we can send software updates. We can do a warm reboot of a dispenser. So you never have to send a technician on site to do that low value type of work. And we can also manage your fuel supply. So we know if your inventory is running low, we can automate the ordering of Right. Let's find the right fuel at the right price, get it delivered at the right time. We can coordinate the delivery from a terminal to a site. And then we also monitor from there um, environmental compliance. We make sure we can detect any sort of leaks. We can detect uh, fraud and theft, which is huge right, huge right now with the uh, um, prices of-, of Yes, and over uh, here in Europe, we got a, uh, I was reading the other day, like a 30% or more uptick in the last month or so, last whatever, six weeks, of people just filling up and driving off. It's remarkable. Yeah. And then and then just theft getting, you know, a little more sophisticated, opening up dispensers. Um, oh, really? There are okay. I, I read the news yesterday, there are trucks rolling over the underground storage tanks and they've carved out the bottom of the, the van or truck and they're able to then just go and directly steal from his underground storage tank. So, you know, that, those that were was things... in Breaking Bad. I don't know whether you we were. Yeah. Did you yeah. see Breaking Bad when they were after the. Um... The ingredient for the drug, so they stopped the train, and that's exactly what they did. Okay, yeah, very similar, very similar. <laughs> we could we could uh, make a movie about this, but yeah, yeah I mean, so the, so the, that's essentially the nature of the services that we offer. It's really about how can I do all of that remotely and avoid having dispatch a service technician to go on site and conduct that work. So how much of that can I resolve remotely? Which which is a very common theme on all IoT use cases. Is it's about it's not about the product. It's about the experience and how do you enhance the experience and automate it, and then do new things such as download of new firmware, remote diagnostics, improve the you know find out what's wrong without having to send a technician out there. And pretty much every use case that we see do that. And we we um, again for the listeners, um, the shameless advertising piece of the podcast. And we not only worked together for several years, but we've also helped design with you a lot of this equipment, haven't we, because of our okay. hardware design uh, capabilities so that it's optimized for the use case. Um, right. um, but but the world is changing. So let's let's transition a bit. You, you've already given a little hint uh, of that because um, you talked about the fact that um, the C store, as you call it, the convenience store. Uh, and I know this from, again, our listeners will know from their own experience. You, it, it used to be you only went to the petrol station or the gas station 
and you you got fuel and you paid for the fuel and you maybe you picked up a snack or whatever and or just a bar while you were waiting to pay and then you left um but now yeah these these uh, stores are they're they're sort of they're becoming little uh little supermarkets um uh, in fact, in fact, and they're selling a lot of things and there's there's other companies in the store. I mean, another one of our customers, Costa, Costa Express, who are part of Coca-Cola now, they have these coffee machines that are in the stores and, you know, there's ATMs there. We got, we got um, uh, another customer, Amazon, with their lockers. Sometimes you see an Amazon locker on the forecourt. So it seems like there's an overall trend to put a lot of other stuff in there um it, oh and by the way we do fuel as well so that is is that if i broadly got that right is that what's happening uh I think so yeah i mean i think really it's very intentional for convenience retailers to try to drive foot traffic inside the store because that's the high margin you know the dry stock that's where they they're getting their profit um right. you know the challenge you still have most these stores that have about half of their annual revenue coming from fuel so it's not going away quickly. I mean, you're still seeing electrification and alternative fuels, and that will happen in time, but it's still a draw to an extent that people still have to fill up their car with gas. But the challenge is it's a really competitive and low margin business. And so what you're seeing convenience retailers try to do is figure out how can I get people to come to the store and fill up their tank, but direct them inside. So you'll see a lot of you know, they're putting media at the pump. We're offering personalization through loyalty and rewards programs on your cell phone. How can you get someone to go inside and buy a, a soda or, um, you know, buy a bag of chips? Because that's where the profitable business really is. And so that's part of it. But then to your point, you know, it's, it's then one step further. How do I improve this consumer experience so that when you see this whole retail apocalypse happening and you're seeing foot traffic go down in retail stores, you're seeing the opposite in convenience retail, where you're seeing foot traffic go up and people are really, you know, coming because of the convenience, the convenience of the location, but just making sure they have the goods available that people need on a daily basis. So, so when you say convenience retail, do you mean not just uh, gas station, poor courts, C stores, but also independent C stores like 7-Elevens or, or, or whatever. So in, is that the trend in, 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 in re, they're, they're the bit of retail that's doing well? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So if you think about the Circle Ks, the 7-Elevens, if you're in North America, depending regionally, you'll get different brands. There's Sheets and Wawa. Here in Texas, we have, uh, it's called Bucky's, where it's a crazy experience. Some of the stores are 68,000 square feet. Um, and so what you're seeing is the market share is increasing for those um, convenience retailers that are more focused on a personalized consumer experience. And you're actually seeing uh, market share reduced with some of the major oil companies that used to be the juggernauts in this space that, you know, every single gas station was branded as a Shell or Chevron. You're so, kind of seeing that shift. And now people are going to a, a convenience store to go inside the store and not just fill up with fuel. Yeah. So that's the difference we're seeing, not just in North America, but but globally. Yeah, we are seeing it globally. Um, the uh, petrol stations, as we call them over here, that, that I drive past on a regular basis, I actually think I see the store brand. Uh, yeah, clearly I see that the Shell logo or the BP logo, because it's up on, on the high of the pole and the colors, I recognize the colors on the gantry, the overhead gantry. But I see, you know, like Waitrose, which is, you know, supermarket the thing, like Waitrose or, or Tesco's or, or and, and they and you kind of thinking, oh, hold on a second, is who owns who here? You know, um, so so there's massive change going on, and um, and massive competition. So, and I think this takes us to the next stage of your story because having um, got the the ATG and the you know the theft and the uh make sure you don't you know get the fuel delivered so that you don't have to put the hood on the on the dispenser get it delivered just in time fix the dispensers in advance um because you can do stuff remotely now what you're 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 you seem to be pivoting to your next strategy which is the it really helping the c store owner because there's going they need more things to pull things in because as you, i think you said earlier fuel's no longer the draw yeah uh, so yeah. now, now you need to accumulate things, but you don't want all these different experiences, I guess. Yeah. I mean, everything's going to be IoT. Everything's going to be connected. 
you know, coffee machines and ATMs and and uh, parcel like Amazon lockers and the dispensers and the cameras and the so suddenly there's all this technology coming in, which arguably has the potential to make things even more complicated because everything's coming from a different vendor, which I guess is an opportunity for you, right? It is. I mean, it's it's very complex and we can talk about the complexity of retrofitting a site. But I think, you know, if you zoom out, what we're trying to do is we see that most of our customers, they're trying to shift their investment from outside the store to inside the store. They want to invest in a personalized consumer experience. And so the opportunity for us is how can we make the operations so seamless, so automated, that then that allows them to invest less in fuel equipment and more inside the store and creating that personalized experience. And so that's what we've been focusing on is, you know, and then we also want to earn the right to be closer to the consumer. But we recognize that we're seen first and foremost as an industrial manufacturing of fueling equipment. So let's start outside the store. Let's make sure that we can just automate all the operations around monitoring the inventory levels, automate everything around the forecourt and the dispensers. And then we earn the right to go inside the store and help our customers with those personalized uh, experiences. But what we're seeing from customers is, hey, I don't wanna buy more ATGs. I don't want to buy more dispensers. What I'd like to do is really create inside the store this amazing experience. And so we're focused on you know, operational efficiencies first and foremost. Um, so that's really you know, the, the first step of the strategy. But I think to your point, you mentioned there are a lot of different things inside the store too, like a, you know, a coffee machine, beverage machines. On average, our customers say that at a site, they have anywhere from 40 to 80 devices that they'd like to get connected. No, much more really? than an, yes, much more than an ATG and the different dispensers and the point of sale, but they have refrigeration, they have, you know, the coffee and beverage machines. There's a lot to get connected. 40 to 80. 40 to 80, um, depending on the size of the site and how sure. sophisticated the retailer is. And so, and that's mostly in North America, but we know that we're not going to get everything connected, but we feel like let's do our part. We should at least get the things connected that we manufacture, that we know how to get connected. So that's the ATG, that's the dispenser, and that's the point of sale. And that really covers a large portion of the critical operations at a site. So that's where we've been focused. So it seems to me that, um, again, if I was a, uh... Uh, what we call over here, a petrol station owner or a forecourt, uh, uh, one of these site owners or a C, C store, as you call it, you're actually becoming more of a business partner for me because you're helping me make this transition in a world that's changing really, really well. And I guess, is there an age, any sort of um, uh, age split here? Because, you know, I'm old enough to say, oh, I'm just old. I'm going to go to the BP at the top of the road because I've always gone to the BP at the top of the road but our our daughter who's in her 20s our youngest daughter you know she's got an electric car and she'd never go to the BP at the top of the road so is there a generational change coming at these people as well absolutely so um I'll age myself my husband and I will still go to the local gas station whatever's closest just to fill up. Yeah. And it's, it's highly unlikely most of the time that we even go inside the store, but we have two teenage daughters. They're 18 and 16. And I mean, we're experiencing this real time. They will pass up every shell, every Chevron to get to 7-Eleven because they have Laredo tacos. Like they are really going for the experience or they'll pass it all up. They'll drive 20 minutes to go to a Bucky's because it has one of the largest gas stations in North America, or they want to go get a Slurpee mm -hmm. and some beaver nuggets or a brisket sandwich. So it is very much a generational difference between boomers and Gen, <clears throat> excuse me, and Gen X versus Gen Y, Gen Z. And um, seeing very different behaviors there. I, I, I feel I should make a public service announcement for our European uh, listeners that we might need to translate. You use three phrases there back to back. And I'm thinking, I have no idea what you're talking oh, about. No. I okay. think what you said was a Bucky's, a beaver nugget. Beaver nuggets are known at a Bucky's. Like what the point is, they have what, food what is that? that is unique to that store. They're actually, you know, creating and promoting their own brand but it's because they have proprietary food and um, apparel within their store. That's <clears> very store. different that's than a gas sure. station. Drive 20, your kids will drive 20 miles because they're loyal to that. Yeah, it's remarkable. 
I mean, they will wear Bucky's t-shirts. Who would have thought that, you know, when we were growing up wearing t-shirts from a gas station may or may not have been cool, but no, this is like a, this is a fad. This is a generational, you know, um, craze here that it's been surprising. Um, but yeah, very much different behaviors based on generation. My, my first job when I was, uh, I guess about 15 or 16, I used to, uh, as you, you would say, pump gas, uh, and, um, just to earn some money. Um, and, uh, uh, they knew I worked at the gas station mainly because the diesel was um, uh, so smelly that it would get on my my t-shirt. So yeah. when I yeah. went out as a student of an evening, I smelled like a, I smelled like a petrol station. Uh, but no, I wouldn't have never thought of wearing the brand. So you're helping these guys transition. Um, you're helping them connect as many things as possible, um, and you're helping them compete with a totally new form of value. And particularly one that appeals to their next generation of customers. So it's it's yet another example. Going back to the beginning of the podcast, it's another example of this. Um, as I said, a now 152 year old company that's got the vision to keep on reinventing itself and reinvented its value proposition to its customers, which I think is pretty cool. There was a lot of, you know, to stay alive for 152 years as a company, you've got to have reinvented yourself you know, right. constantly. And I think a lot of people don't know the story about GBR. They think it's a, you know, it's a, it's, well, first of all, they don't know the brand because you don't see it. And if they do know the brand, oh yeah, that's a, you know, carbon fuel, com- you know, related company that does the tank monitoring. And, but what you're doing is actually creating IOT solutions for s- small business owners. That's, that's right. And um, I'm going to plant a seed because I bet that you look next time you go to fill up your car with gas. But, you know, before I joined this company and I went to fill up my tank, I never paid attention to the manufacturer of the dispenser. Yeah, I don't now know. We're, it's really an oligopoly. There are two primary providers. It's either GBR or Gilbarco Vita Root or our competitor. I look every time. Even my kids say, hey, mom, we might need to go to a different gas station. This isn't GBR equipment. So um, it, it's interesting that I pay attention to that now. But And also when you do fill up your tank, it's supposed to take you less than three minutes. Um, I have my kids trained now that we, we time it. And if it takes more than three minutes, you know, that could be that they need to change their filters out. So it's funny when you join an organization that you had nothing to do with the industry, how you pay attention to things that you never had before. Is, is that one of the, uh, it's fascinating, this, it's things I've always wanted to ask about, about, about uh, filling up my car. So sometimes I fill up my car, right? I put the nozzle in, I pull the trigger and it goes really fast, you know, click and I'm done. Other times, Sometimes it's slow because there's somebody else the other side of the little island there. And I'm thinking, well, we're both sharing the, the, the same pump or something. And sometimes I'm just on my own and it's slow, right? Yeah. And so is, is that, and because and you're in the industry, I think you just said, because they need to change the filter. Is it, yeah. is it stuff like that that causes it to, to go slow? It's called slow flow. Like we have, yeah, I mean, the, the lingo is we call that slow flow, slow flow. We can detect that. So we can actually remotely say, hey, these dispensers are efficient. You have a site over here that they're not efficient. And it may be as simple as you need to go change your filters. But if you see that it's systemic at the site and every dispenser is slow, then it could be that you have a dirty tank underground that you need to actually um, you know, manage and clean the tank. So yeah, I mean, that's definitely something that we see regularly that we can help our our customers detect, because what it does is it creates a negative experience. If you go to a convenience retail store and you, it takes you six, seven minutes to fill up, you will be like, man, that place is always slow. Let me just yeah, go exactly. ahead and drive across the street. And so yeah. that's all around how do we help them optimize their operations so that people are more likely to go inside the store and you know buy the higher margin goods. So it's all about making everything outside the store seamless, frictionless. How do you make it easy so that then they're more likely to go inside? And, and, and I guess not requiring additional labor, because the last thing these store owners want to do is they want more stuff, more reasons to visit, not just fuel, but all these other things. Um, uh, I think one of those other things you called, you, you said called out was a sloppy. I still don't know what a sloppy is, but my guess is it's a drink. Um, Slurpee. Uh, yeah, Slurpee. 
Oh, yes. Slurpee. Oh, I do know a Slurpee. Slurpee. I've heard of a Slurpee. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a Slurpee. I thought you said a Slurpee. Okay. But but I guess they don't want to have to then maintain all these things and touch all these things. And that's where IoT comes in, because what you're saying is, no, don't touch it, because we not only smart enable it, but we do uh, 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 and not just reactive maintenance, so we'll send someone out, but proactive and preemptive uh, maintenance, kind of, you know, most people know that, the Tesla yes. model, you know, it's you or your iphone you know you when you it, it gets regular software updates and one of the things that yes you get new features but most of the time it's fixing issues you didn't know you had so you don't experience a problem in the first place so by having this sort of iot fabric or this iot capability this aggregation capability for the site you're able to let people i guess have a lot of um you said, I think 40, I'm still thinking about the 40 to 80, wow. Uh, 40 to 80 things that uh, are communicating data that are creating a, a differentiated experience, like monitoring the fridges and et cetera, et cetera, without having to have lots of people on site to fix it when stuff goes wrong. Um, so it, I guess the vision is that the uh, site uh, owner or the, uh, the manager of the site is really, um, is not having to touch these things because you're as you're taking care of it for them you're almost outsourcing the management of all this stuff to you guys allowing them just to focus on what's important for them but not managing all this stuff yeah one of our largest customers and um, they have franchisees and their statement to us was we we want our site operators our franchisees to have to show up and take out the trash and that's it Everything else for them is seamless. It's automated. We can do um, things remotely. So that's exactly right. That's the future vision of many of these convenience retailers is let's figure out how we can automate everything because to your point, um, they don't want to have to continuously increase the number of people at the site because the complexity or the service offerings are expanding. They want to be able to, you know, expand their service offerings, but have the same footprint of labor, if you will. That's a great phrase, isn't it? You know, uh, we talked about Costa Coffee. They, 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 um, they call the, uh, their machine the, the barista without a beard because it's, the, it's a barista quality coffee, but it doesn't have a beard. And then the, you know, the, the, the future goal is that the, the, the site owner's main job is to take out the trash. Yeah. <laughs> it's the, um, but it's all about the experience being delivered electronically and capturing the data and, and whatever. It's a great story. I, I just want to finish, if we can, we do have a few minutes, and I want to go back, wind back to, there'll be some people who, who a lot of people listening to this saying, wow, I, I, I've learned a lot, which I certainly have, about the whole environment where I go fuel my, my vehicle uh, and how it's all connected together and how it works. But there also was that bit of the story right at the beginning, the change management story. And, and that's where I said, I, you know, I had a, I've done a couple of roles, one at HP and one at Cisco doing change management, but I didn't start from where you started from. You know, they were already a technology company uh, and software company uh, at that time. What learnings, looking back, what, what did you do, you know, briefly, what did you do to try and do the change management? Because you came in, turn around a business. But I guess there were, it's, it's as much a culture change as a, as, a, as a strategy change. So did you, did you have to hire new people? Did you, did you have to go outside for people? Or what, just what, in, looking back, what was it that you did? That, that, it's a that huge worked? culture change. I think that was, you know, it's always the people side that's um, the most difficult most at times. Difficult. We, we didn't go through a dramatic change in our personnel deeper in the organization, but I knew that I needed to um, take a look at the sitting leaders and make sure we had the right mix. So, uh, but, but not to move too quickly because to your point, it's about change management, not um, shocking the system, right? Making sure that we pace ourselves. And so one of the things that I recognized is to be a, a growth oriented SaaS business within an industrial manufacturing organization, we've got to have some modern technology skill sets here. So I knew that I had to focus on introducing that within the organization, giving some fresh perspective, but it couldn't be over tilted. 
um, it had to be balanced. What I knew is that the industry is very tight knit and you have to build the credibility and know the industry and know the lingo. It's something that I didn't have. So I knew that I needed to balance that industry credibility with the you know, modern current skill set with regard to technology. But then I also needed, because of this deep rooted culture and a PL that's been around for over 150 years, I also needed to really um, honor that institutional knowledge, that native genius yes. that we had. And yes. so I was very intentional about trying to balance the leadership the teams so that, I, that I had a little bit of each of those perspectives. So that the organization, yeah, I found that. So you have to drive change, but you don't want to turn the whole organization against you so that they, because they will, there's more of them than you <laughs> and they'll, and they'll make sure you don't succeed if they feel that, that threatened in any way. So it is that tricky uh, tricky uh, balance, um, but worth it when you when you see the change. Um, well, I think there's a pride, right? I mean, a lot of the people that I work with have been with the organization for 20 to 30 years. That doesn't yeah. happen anymore. And so I think it's important not to come in and say, hey, you're doing it all wrong. No, I mean, it's, it's hey, there's just a, maybe a, a different way of looking at it. And so I think it's finding that, um, you know, the communication style, the leadership style to question some of the status quo, to introduce some new ideas, but not to come across as condescending or antagonistic, right? Yes. And so that's the that's the balance. Um, you know, we didn't always get it right. I didn't always get it right. But I think that's been the learning here is how can we um, become more collaborative, create an awareness and teach the organization about a different model, a different mindset, a different culture. And I'm really proud of the cultural changes that we've made. I think that's if I had my stamp on one thing, it would be culture. I'm really proud that when I entered the organization, our engagement scores were relatively low. I think it'd been an acquisition that had kind of stagnated over five years. I think our engagement scores were in the 50s. And within 12 months, uh, we were at 89 because we just brute forced culture. Hey, we've got to be different. Doesn't mean that we're not honoring our heritage, but we've got to you know, think differently and behave differently. And sometimes it's acting yourself into a new way of thinking. Well, that is a great place to uh, finish. And uh, as I said earlier, we're really proud to be a partner with you on this uh, journey. And we uh, uh, know there's a lot of exciting things uh, still to come. Uh, but that's a really interesting story. We've not had a podcast like this, and I, I, I'm really glad we did because um, uh, to show, we talk about IoT and often it's technology or the individual players within IoT. But we talk about, I, at the same time, IoT really is an enabler of, of business model disruption. And so to hear a story from the inside of how a, a, a company can disrupt itself and a company that, again, that, you know, that's 150 years old, a lot of people work there for a long time, uh, high market share, so why change? But in a market that's changing so rapidly around you is such a, um, is such a great story. So uh, thank you again. Uh, thank you. My thank guest. you so much. It's been yeah. a lot of fun. Um, this yeah. has been a remarkable journey at GVR, but I also am honored that you've invited me to come and oh, talk indeed. to you today. So thank you. Really glad to uh, help you on. You, I, I, I'm glad to have you on, on the show. And and uh, and I've learned a lot. Um, and I will now look at that dispenser. Right. But, you know, like when you're thinking of buying a car, there's suddenly every car you see. So oh, I didn't realize there were so many of those cars out there. I will now look at that uh, dispenser and I'm sure I'll see the uh, GVR. I guarantee uh, you will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're just right in front of me all of this time. Uh, so I'll wrap it up there. And for our listeners, I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, uh, I'm sure you have. Uh, you've been listening to the IoT Leaders podcast with me, your host, Nico, CEO of, of SI, and, and Rachel Collins who um, of GBR, who really just shared with us such a fabulous story of business transformation in a real world environment. Uh, uh, you know, a real spread from where we started to where they are now and clearly a vision uh, for where they wanted to go in the future with a with a, a big hairy audacious goal which is the role of the site manager is just to take the trash out in the future so that is a uh, a, a wonderful aspiration um, and uh, to automate everything and it's a great iot story so rachel thank you so much um, thank you uh, for being our partner and thank you for being my guest on the IoT Leaders podcast. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.